Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us at tonight's COVID-19 and the Court's uh, question and answer session. My name is Carolyn Entwistle, and I'm the Bar Council's Director of Services and the current chair of the COVID-19 Working Group. I'm joined this evening by a panel that requires little introduction. Chair of the Bar, Derek Sweeting QC. Chair of the Criminal Bar Association, James Mulholland QC. Chair of the Bar Council's Young Barristers Committee, Joanne Kame, and last but by no means least, her Honour Judge Co QC, or Polly to her friends, which is what we will be for the purposes of tonight's event. Before we begin the panel discussions, which tonight will focus on the safety of our practitioners in the courts, the current backlogs, um, or rather the current backlog and how it might be addressed, and the measures that are being taken to make the case for improved funding throughout the justice system, there are a couple of pieces of housekeeping that I need to run through. Um, this event firstly is being recorded and it will be made available over the coming days. The only persons that will be visible on the recordings are those that you can see now. So if you're not a member of the panel, you can sit back, relax, make as many different facial expressions as you please. You'll have noticed that your microphone's muted. And so if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. You're invited to submit que questions to us throughout the event, um, and I will do my best to feed them into our discussions as fluidly as possible. It's important to note that we won't be monitoring the chat function on the right hand of the screen, so please stick to the use of the Q&A tab. Now, without further ado, I'm going to begin the discussions. So, uh, in relation to safety in the court, in early January, HMCTS announced that it was developing uh, a limited pilot scheme to test court users for COVID-19. Um, James, you, you advocated quite strongly for that and uh, for the immediate rollout of, of countrywide mass testing. Have you uh, any idea of how the, the pilot scheme is progressing? Are we likely to see it extended in the near future? Um, and, and what kind of impact would it have for the criminal bar in particular? Um, yes, thanks, Carolyn, and, and um, hello to everybody attending tonight. Yes, I, I, uh, the, the CBA did advocate quite strongly, not only for lateral flow testing in all court areas, so that staff and users could be tested regularly, but also prisoners within the cells. And we advocated, forgive me, before they get to the cells, prisoners in prison. And we advocated quite strongly for that. Let's deal with the issue of the court areas. Yes. Um, HMCTS have, are, are actually halfway through a pilot scheme in Manchester Civic Court Centre. There have been the odd bit of teething problems, but in essence, things are moving well. And we understand there is also a pilot starting at Southwark Crown Court next week. But as, as we understand it in discussions with HMCTS on a regular basis, they are intending and are in the process of planning for a wider rollout to more court centres across the country, particularly in larger conurbations, larger areas, so that the courts will have lateral flow testing available to them. And we have emphasised that they need to get on with it as quickly as possible. And hopefully this will commence in earnest in March so that we will see the evidence of it then. So that's good news. The second point is that we have been uh, banging on hard about prisoners not coming to court without having been laterally flow tested. And that again is beginning to hit home. We've now been informed that HMP Bristol has started a scheme whereby no prisoner leaves that prison unless they have been negatively tested under the lateral testing scheme. That is being rolled out now to all prisons throughout London and we hope and we really stress to them that that needs to get nationwide as quickly as possible. So mercifully, some positive news on that. It's very important because uh, as we stress to HMCTS, our members need to feel safe. Uh, and this is one important aspect of that safety measure being put forward. Great, thank you, James. I think that's, um, that is positive <clears throat> and uh, perhaps better late than never. Um, Derek, is there any anything that you'd like to add to to that um, particular topic? Well, I'm just to say that um, there are two features of the testing that they're proposing. Firstly, that it won't be all courts. So we shouldn't run away with the idea that every court is going to have lateral flow testing. And the other is that this is voluntary. 
and it's not just voluntary for people who are coming to court it's voluntary for members of staff as well so we are asking questions about how that sits with it directly employed staff and agency staff who we think may have a different approach to voluntary testing so there are things we are trying to understand about how it will be rolled out and how it will operate in in practice in order to maximize its effectiveness but i absolutely agree with james it's an important confidence factor i think for court users Mm, certainly. Um, I mean, one of the things that obviously is is kind of connected in a way to the call for testing is is the call for vaccination uh, of, of barristers and and indeed other court users, um, all of whom are are classified as critical critical workers. Is that something that the bar council has has been making a case for, or has any specific strategy around, Derek? Well, I think the case for vaccination is one that's that's better made really behind the scenes at the moment with HMCTS in particular, and they have been making the case for um, court users in the position of legal professionals in particular and jurors and so on to be vaccinated at an early stage. And I think realistically vaccines at the moment have to be rationed and they have to be used in a logical way to try and deal with what the core of the problem is, which is people being admitted to hospital who are seriously ill, and obviously a lot of them dying. And there is quite a lot of scientific consensus behind the categorization that the government has employed for vaccination. And I think what we're going to find is that there will come a stage when professional groups will be considered for vaccination. And we want to make sure that our voice is heard in relation to that. I think the one exception, and I mean, it's an interesting question in itself, I think, is the question of whether jurors ought to be vaccinated, because jurors are in a slightly different position, aren't they? They're, they're performing a public service. It's a remarkable feature, I think, of the pandemic that there's been no difficulty in getting people to, on the whole, to perform that um, important civic duty. And I think there is an argument for saying that there is a sort of civic pro, quid pro quo for that, which is that if you are going to be required to come to court under compulsion to perform that important role, then vaccination might go hand in hand with that. But it still has to be fitted in with prioritisation. I think actually, if you vaccinated jurors, you might then consider more widely the question of who else in the court needed to be vaccinated as well. But, but I think that's one approach to vaccination in the, the justice setting. Great, thank you for that. Um, Joanne, do you, do you think that by um, implementing uh, the the tests for court users and also potentially uh, as as Derek's mentioned mentioned vaccination either for for jurors or for other legal professionals that this will improve the the confidence that the young bar in particular has when instructed uh, to in, attend in person we know that they they are a group that are in court often um, or do you think other measures uh, really need to be taken that extend beyond rapid testing and, and vaccinations and the like? I mean, there's no one single answer um, to this. I think we all agree on that. All of these things are taken as various pieces in a puzzle. Um, it goes alongside social distancing, general court safety measures and matters like that. I think that one thing that needs to be borne in mind in relation to the young bar um, is that although we are going to court a lot and covering a lot of hearings that um, are not able to be facilitated online and maybe are shorter hearings, um, there is a real desire to be interested in the safety of those around you. So those who are defending and prosecuting, they're also interested in the safety of the defendants that they're coming into contact with in cells, um, any witnesses that they're coming into contact with or complainants or any or any victims. Um, so this is not, it's not just a self-interested thing from the Young Bar's perspective, because there is a real awareness that it's not just our own health and safety, it's all of the people that we encounter at court on the journeys there and back, and when we're back at home again. So um, I would say that it's one part of the puzzle, but it's something that um, we think is important for everybody in society, because the court is such a melting pot of people coming from various places and all kind of coming together in one big arena. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, you, you mentioned safety uh, several times over, and I think one of the ways in which uh, the safety of, of our members and court users has been 
protected to an extent over the past months is through the use of CVP, which we've seen a, a massive kind of escalation in. Um, it almost goes without saying that it will continue post pandemic, although we're yet to see in, in what sort of form and that it could therefore contribute to the, the, back, the reduction of the backlog, which uh, we're coming on to later. Um, Polly, I, I think it's it would be really interesting to hear about the, the challenges that the, the use of CVB, CVP, CVP have <laughs> presented for you and your colleagues. Um, and, you know, whether you think that the experience of the judiciary could uh, assist with any future improvements to the system. Um, and it, it, indeed, if there's a route for you to, to kind of feed back on it. Oh, you're on mute. I set up a, a system in Nottingham Court where if you speak when you're uh, on mute, you have to pay a small fine for donation to charity. So I'll be putting some money in the pot later. It's quite a lot. Um, I said good evening, everybody. Um, and there's a lot to say about CVP. Um, some of it's good, some of it's not so good. Um, obviously, it was expedited in terms of its development. It was in the pipeline anyway. Um, and there's been real effort made for training for the staff and the judiciary. Obviously, it benefits people uh, in the sense that they don't have to come to court, there's less traveling uh, and so on. And one of the big surprises to me um, is to realize how many people either don't have access to the internet, don't know how to use a smart device. Um, I had a, a grab crane driver who peered at the screen at me and said, it's the closest I've ever been to a computer, love. Um, and I think that it's only ever as good, despite it being such a good idea to be for everybody to be able to access it from uh, just a web browser, you don't need um, the software, um, is that uh, so many people, it just depends on whether the strength and the quality of their own internet signal. So however good the technology is at one end, if it's not working at the other, um, then there's, there are real problems. Um, I'm afraid I think for the most part, um, most of the remote uh, hearings are, take up more time than attended hearings. And that's another big surprise to me. Uh, perhaps not a trial that's, that's running, say a civil trial, um, but doing a list, an admin type list in the criminal courts, if you've got half an hour slots, some things take five minutes, some things you really need more than that. Um, and that's a problem. Um, but for the future, I think there are going to be um, real advantages. Um, it's going to be easier for people to be accommodated so that they don't have to travel. It might help people with uh, more flexible working. Uh, it's certainly going to help, um, I should think, in things like very expensive experts not having to travel and come to court. And what I would um, think is most likely to happen is that in the future post pandemic, um, there'll be a lot more hybrid hearings. There'll be a lot more situations in which it's a largely attended hearing or half attended hearing. And then there will be people who dial in for all sorts of perfectly good reasons um, who don't actually need uh, to be there. Great, thank you, Polly. And I, I think on that point, and and as I mentioned, um, you know, it's it's fairly obvious that CVP is is here to stay, so to speak. Um, I'll open this up to to Derek, uh, James, and Joanne. Um, do you do you personally think that the use of CVB CVP? I really need to pronounce that correctly. Has any negative consequence, um, for example, in relation to procedural fairness, access to justice? Um, uh, and otherwise, and is there anything that can really be done to mitigate uh, those those consequences? I don't know who'd like to go first, Derek. I can kick off. I mean, I think the point Polly makes about digital exclu exclusion is a is a really good one because there are lots of people who aren't in a position where they can access the internet easily or at all, and I think it just comes as a surprise sometimes to those of us who are doing it all the time in the course of our work and using the internet for the business of life that people just don't do that. I mean, I think myself, technology is a bit more a bit like a wave, really. I mean, it, um, I grew up in a house without a telephone and you then get to the point where not just telephones, but everybody is assumed to have a mobile phone and so, and so on. And those things become 
almost necessities, don't they, as Wi-Fi is becoming. I think that's becoming a bit like another utility, which is regarded as, as absolutely essential. So I think we'll have a sort of catch up with technology and it will improve. CVP is, is going to be replaced by another platform, which is better. And we've seen in the sort of COVID laboratory, things um, get better all the time. So I think I'm reasonably optimistic about the technology getting better. I think, however, there are some things that are very difficult to change and they are really rooted not in technology, but in us and the ways in which people interact and so on. And I think we do find in, in the setting of a court that there are some aspects of the work that is done in the courts, which is just much better done in person. And if this had gone on for three or four months, we might be more enthusiastic than we are perhaps about remote hearings. I think because it's gone on for so long, we've had the opportunity to see what all the downsides are as well. And so the challenge going forward is to try to take the good out of that and, and keep it going and develop it, but also to recognize that there is actually an important role for face-to-face -face hearings and there always will be. I do with James, Joanne, if you'd like to, to add to that at all. Um, yes, I mean, it, it, let's look at it very much in general. In-person meetings, in-person hearings are massively important in certain contexts. They're massively important for building trust and for the giving of advice and the receiving of advice in the proper manner. And they're obviously massively important for encouraging the exchange of confidential information, uh, which is what we are generally involved in. But obviously, at different stages, the balance is going to shift depending upon where you are. I mean, at the moment, during a pandemic, the balance is in favour of default hearings remotely. Um, say for jury trials, to reduce footfall, to encourage the use of jury trials, unless the advocates and judge agree otherwise. Immediately post-pandemic, it's also going to be important to retain the use of CVP as much as we can, because we're going to have to tackle a backlog. Again, reduced footfall is going to be important to ensure Nightingale Courts and existing court estates are used predominantly for jury trials and for essential in-person hearings. But moving forward from that, we have to exercise caution because otherwise you can see an erosion of basic liberties very quickly. And a key distinction has to be made that in-person hearings have tremendous qualities that can never be replaced long-term by remote hearings. Thank you, James. And I, I think we've actually got a question from the audience that feeds into uh, some of what you've just been saying, which is, uh, should there be a presumption in favor of CVP for mentions and PCM, PCMHs, at present we still have to go through a process of making an application. Um, and that obviously uh, relates to the, the current environment that we're in, uh, as well as uh, the, the kind of long-term and the future of CVP or otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we've said to the senior judiciary for a very long time, stretching back to July last year, we even provided them with a draft document. We need a remote hearings protocol. Why? Because otherwise different courts will operate different policies. One court might say, you make an application at 9.30 on the morning of the hearing, you've then got to travel to court if it's unsuccessful. Other courts say you've got to make an application 2.30 the, the, the day before the hearing. Many counsel won't even have been instructed at 2.30 the day before the hearing. And that creates confusion, it creates tension, it creates anger. And that's why we suggested a remote hearing. In lieu of that, then you should realistic or realistically, or the announcement should be that the default position, save for certainly, for example, jury trials, perhaps save for sentences, certainly for administrative hearings, should be non-attendance. However, because otherwise, you know, there are going to be problems. However, let me say this: if applications stay as they are, council need to be careful, because what we've noticed is that council say they're unable to attend but they don't explain that the case will not be progressed if they are compelled to attend in person. And they need to do both in any application and they need to make it an application rather than a statement of intent. Uh, and just to say they're not going to turn up because we are finding that they may do one, but not the other. And judges of course have a duty under the CPRs to ensure the progress of the case. 
even in a pandemic or, or particularly because of a pandemic. And it's important for council when they make that application to bear in mind those two factors. Great, thank you, James. Uh, I, I wasn't envisioning we would dispense with top tips, but I'm all for it. Um, <laughs> Derek, is there anything that you would like to add or, or even uh, you, Polly, to, to the kind of consistency uh, by which CVP is used and, uh, and, and where indeed it should be? Well, I think, as you know, I sit across various jurisdictions and certainly in civil jurisdiction in the county court, there is a presumption effectively that it will be a remote hearing, either video platform or telephone. But then the, the, the advantages, obviously, directions go out in advance of a listed hearing and it all is all set out that we have a set of COVID directions. And I think there's uh, there would be some real value in transferring some of that learning uh, to the criminal court. Yes, I mean, I think the, the two the two biggest things that come into the e box, the, the inbox about this are firstly a lack of consistency. That's the first thing. So that we don't we find that different courts are taking different approaches, and that may be ironing itself out. And James and I have certainly made the case together, in fact, with HMCTS on a number of occasions for having something which gave us more of a guide to what the position would be across hearings and so on. And I think that has to be done in cooperation with the judiciary, but we tried to start the ball rolling by saying, wouldn't it be good to have at least an assumption that certain things would be done in a particular way? And, and particularly given that we will have sort of COVID hearings for, for some time to come. So that's the first thing. The other one, which I think is more worrying sometimes is that we get examples of things which appear to be objectively unreasonable um, listings of in-person hearings. And it's quite difficult. I mean, some of them, we can't investigate them all, but some of them on investigation turn out to be a sort of misunderstanding, I think, between the court and counsel but others don't. Others do turn out to be something which looks as if um, listing has been done on a bit of a whim. I mean, those are, are not that common now. They're becoming less common, but it still has been a feature of the, the pandemic. I mean, I, it may be that Joanne can add something to that because it's a, it's a problem that affects the young bar in particular. Yeah, I agree with that. I think one thing that's really key, it's not to plug, but um, when people tell us about these issues, um, Derek in particular, um, but as well on behalf of the Young Bar, we really do have these direct links like the CBA through James to HMCTS, to the courts, um, and, and those things are really helpful to be raised. But one thing that I think we have to remember when we're discussing CVP is there are a lot of vulnerable people within the criminal justice system and sometimes vulnerabilities are only picked up on through non-verbal cues and things that you really can't appreciate through a screen. So I think that's something that we all have to bear in mind and the balance will have to be found somewhere. Um, obviously, there are so many good things from the Young Bar perspective in terms of saving expense and time and not going to court for um, a lot of hearings. But at the same time, um, I think a lot of the Young Bar are also concerned about the well-being impact, because especially when you're starting out on your feet, the ability to talk to someone in the roving room um, before hearing just to maybe check something or sometimes to decompress after is so essential. And the final thing, because I know we're running over a little bit on this question, but we also need to remember pupils in this scenario too, because this online learning environment, um, although it's very useful in terms of the future of advocacy, um, we need to also make sure that their training is not suffering. So we all have a responsibility as a profession to bear those people in mind as well, as well as the clients, obviously, um, that we're seeing through these links. No, certainly. And actually, on the point of uh, well-being, we'll be running uh, another Q and A on on that later in the month, uh, which I'll provide details of towards the end of uh, this event. Um, on the subjects of plugging things, uh, we have something else for, for the audience to attend if they like. Um, we've, before we move on, we've got one other question that relates to uh, this topic specifically, um, which I, I will summarise. It's it's effectively about uh, problems that are experienced with the audibility or otherwise during uh, a CVP hearing and um, in the event that a barrister complains about that to the judge, um, the, uh, 
the response that they receive not necessarily being a positive one. So the, the specific example is uh, the barrister complaining to the judge in question, uh, the judgment ignoring the extent of the problems and the judge also threatening the barrister uh, with a complaint to the Bar Standards Board. Um, I don't know whether the, the panel has any advice about what uh, a barrister could do in that situation. Um, and I'll, I'll open that up again to, to everybody because uh, I think it's, it's relevant to, to Polly uh, as well as to, to Derek Joanne and, and you, James. Yeah, I mean, I think that particular art question is probably based upon a hearing which got quite, um, might have been quite intemperate um, as a result of the problems that were being encountered. I mean, it's, un it's unusual for a judge in the course of a hearing to start threatening counsel with um, being reported to the BSB just because of problems with connectivity. But I think going back to, to Polly's point, I mean, it is it is difficult. We we don't necessarily have people at the other end who have got good equipment and good connections and so on. And it might be interesting to hear from Polly as to what she does and how she approaches hearings where things start to go wrong, because it's it's obviously a problem which will arise in practice. Well, I can only speak from my own experience. Um, I've certainly never ignored uh, the problem. Um, there are real problems where there are interpreters. There are real problems where there are intermediaries. There are real problems where people haven't been sufficiently prepared in advance so that you've got somebody and they have got their smartphone. And again, perhaps I'm thinking more about um, civil or, or family, but they don't have access to the documents on a separate device, something like that. Um, and I've had to abort, I should think probably not that many, um, but maybe four or five throughout the whole pandemic because it simply became uh, unworkable because it became apparent. I mean, I had somebody was uh, giving a witness, she was giving witness um, evidence from her home and she had her two small children there. Um, and nobody had thought, you know, we all give the advice, you must be somewhere quiet and private, but who's going to look after the kids? Um, so I've just said, we'll stop. Um, and it, it may have to be a hybrid hearing, it may have to be an attended hearing. Sometimes it can be um, got around by people going to solicitors' offices, obviously, um, with the appropriate arrangements in place, but it, um, there are problems, uh, and if it's not going well, then you can't carry on. You can't, you can't make important decisions about people's lives when they're sitting in their living room and they can't hear what's going on. No, certainly. I think it's it's also important to mention from the uh, perspective of the Bar Council that we have a, a wonderful ethical inquiries service. Um, and uh, particularly over the last 12 months, the, the policy team who, who man the hotline have, have dealt with a lot of uh, COVID related ethical issues um, and, and worked in conjunction with the, the ethics committee to, to, you know, provide guidance to the relevant practitioners. So that's something that uh, any barrister in, in the situation that's been referenced or, or any other uh, ethical situation uh, might want to utilise. Um, it's, it's genuinely a very, very good service, in my opinion. Um, although I would say that I'm biased, but, but my colleagues work very hard to, to keep themselves updated and uh, to provide you know, good and effective guidance to barristers. Um, Right, well, shall we move on uh, to the, the last kind of uh, area that I wanted to touch upon in relation to safety in the court, which is um, just that we've received a lot of questions in, in advance of this event that uh, really are for uh, HMCTS to deal with directly. And um, we, we aren't intending to kind of cover those off in great detail this evening, um, particularly because HMCTS is, is keen to see individual queries raised directly with the courts themselves. Um, we are uh, continuously addressing uh, individual uh, issues that are raised with HMCTS through both the COVID-19 working group and the, the Talk to Spot app. But I thought it would be good to, to kind of end this particular um, part of the event uh, by hearing uh, from Derek and James about the, the engagement that they have with HMCTS and um, just to, to encourage them to highlight any specific uh, and current areas of focus in terms of those discussions. Um, so James, do you, do you perhaps want to go first? 
Yeah, um, well, as, as Derek said, we meet regularly with HMCTS. Uh, um, I think Paul Harris, who's one of the individuals with whom we meet, is getting sick of the sight of me. But um, the, the reality is we, we I, I, I meet generally twice a week. I emphasize the need for all manner of measures to be taken, uh, a massively important measure that keeps reoccurring within our membership in the Criminal Bar Association is that whilst there may be safety measures at HQ, when you actually attend a call, there's those safety measures aren't in place, they're not being pursued. And time and again, we're hearing about mass individuals being allowed in on mass into court buildings if they're family, not complying with social distancing, not wearing face masks in magistrates' courts. And that therein really lies one of the most crucial tensions between HMCTS and us. Uh, but they're listening and they are engaging because we keep saying the same thing so often. And one of the, the areas, for example, where they are listening is we have said you need marshals, whether or not you take them from the existing court staff, but you need people in public areas monitoring whether or not social distancing measures, the wearing of masks are being followed, whether or not people are engaging because the reality is it is a close contact setting, despite whatever they say, because it involves the sharing of confidential information and you can't avoid that and people will forget from time to time. And they're listening, they're saying that they are going to implement marshals and they are going to implement other measures. So I promise you, we do talk to them regularly. One of the things they are, they do say to us repeatedly is that there aren't enough complaints that the escalation measures and the complaints measures that we at the CBA asked them to put in place uh, are not being pursued and that, for example, escalation processes up to delivery di directors uh, are not being utilised. And, and I think really we need people to bombard them with complaints. It will take a bit of time and people will say, well, you know, isn't it after the horse is bolted? But I still think they need to know because we keep telling them about the anecdotal accounts that we're being sent, but you really do need them to hear directly from you. And if, if you want us to, we can give you, I think uh, they've published the delivery directors for each area, but um, we can send them to you again, but, but really pursue those procedures because they need to know what is happening on the ground. You're on mute now. <laughs> I just noticed as I was typing. Derek, would you like to add to that at all? <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I think it's important to say that we have good working relationships with HMCTS and that doesn't stop the meetings being challenging I mean that's what we do in court isn't it we we have good relationships we hope with our opponents and the judges but we can still be effective and we have very challenging meetings with them where we repeat as James has said our, our points often from week to week we're having a, a safety meeting every Tuesday afternoon now with a broad spectrum of HMCTS representatives and we do get changes out of it. We do get a recognition that custody suites are not um, non-close contact situations. You have to sit opposite somebody in a small room. But if you take prisoners to court and they're awaiting a test, that's not ideal. In fact, it's positively dangerous uh, and so on. So we've made those, those points over a long period of time. And it would be fair to say, as James mentioned, that uh, HMCTS listen and they do address those concerns, but we'll keep on plugging away at the meetings we have with them in order to make sure that they're brought to the fore. I think the last thing on this is that the HMCTS position on this is that local is best. And I tend to agree with them. The best place to raise a problem is with the court in which it arises and to do it quickly. And I mean, there are one or two things that sort of come to us at the Bar Council uh, accompanied by, no, we didn't say anything at the time to anybody in court. And sometimes there are good reasons, but that's not the best basis on which to be, then be taking the complaint on to HMCTS. So local is best and equally doing things through the circuits as well as through HMCTS escalation procedures is very effective. I think each of the circuit leaders and the circuit structures that the Bar has in place have been really effective in driving change and making sure that concerns are acted on. Great, thank you, Derek. Um, so I'd like us to move on to the issue of the backlog. Um, and uh, first of all, just uh, touch upon the, the Justice Committee oral evidence session in early January. 
Um, so during that, we heard the, the backlog in the magistrates court is, is currently uh, about 18 percent above pre-pandemic -pan levels. And uh, that in the Crown Court, it's reached, uh, I think it's, it's around 53,000 cases. James, how concerned should we be about the reality of an increase in the backlog uh, by 2024 in, in both the magistrates' courts and the, the Crown Courts? Well, obviously, um, listen, we have to be concerned about any backlog that increases delays for ordinary vulnerable men and women, be they complainant, witness or defendant, and the attendant consequences. But we need to be very careful here that we don't somehow blow this into a crisis which is insurmountable, because it isn't a crisis which is insurmountable. The reference you make to the evidence to the um, JSC was, I think, from a company called Crest Advisory, which suggested that on January 2020 figures, if we don't do anything, if government doesn't do anything, you'll get a backlog of 195,000 Crown Court trials by 2024 and half a million uh, backlog in relation to the magistrates courts at the same time. But that's not going to happen because government is doing something. And, and let me just say this very quickly. We have a backlog probably of about 50 odd thousand cases, 54,000 cases. It was bigger in 2010. We have a backlog probably of about 33, 34, 35,000 Crown Court cases. If I tell you that in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2015, we dealt with, concluded more Crown Court trials than currently um, are in this backlog. Because when I say concluded, that means the combination of effective and crack trials. So we have an estate which is capable of dealing with this backlog. If we look at 2019, 2019, we had a government driven cut to um, the number of court sitting days. Basically, they closed courts that should have been open. In 2019, we were having 210, 220 Crown Courts rooms used for trials by the end of that period with the cuts to sitting days. But we still managed to deal with 20,332 trials concluded, that is in terms of effective and cracked. So even utilizing about 40% of the existing court estate, we managed to deal with 20,000. You double that, you increase the capacity in terms of rooms by use of Nightingale courts and the existing court estate, you will be able to tackle the backlog, not in um, ridiculous figures of three and a half, four years time, or I heard somebody say 10 years time, but as long as they employ more court staff, as long as they ensure that there is a criminal bar that stays and there we put the pressure on Sir Christopher and his review but as long as they take care of the attendant personnel we have uh, the capacity in terms of courtrooms to be able to deal with this crisis in uh, a reasonable time. I would have thought having looked at the statistics 18 months now it's still important that government puts in place all these things now and also we utilize CVP but it's important that we contextualize it because otherwise you, you hear arguments that we should tamper with the quality of justice delivered, that we should have discriminatory ideas such as extended operating hours, when really people are ignoring the statistics and looking at rather rash solutions to problems that can be dealt with in a sensible and different way. Great, thank you. And um, you, you mentioned as, as part of that, James, that... Uh, the increase to the kind of resources within the courts, so employing more staff, um, and that's something that that has obviously been suggested uh, would be needed in order to stabilise the backlog. Um, I, I'd be interested to hear from uh, Polly if um, uh, the kind of doubling of resources is a realistic possibility for the, the judiciary, as uh, obviously resources uh, relate both to people and to um, for example, tech, uh, and as James has mentioned, the, the courtrooms themselves. Is it something that, that is actually achievable? Um, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Douglas Adams, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, but he talks about the fundamental interconnectedness of everything. And I think when you talk about resources, as James has already said, you have to look at the, it in the totality so it is staff it's the estate 
it's the judiciary, it's the cells, it's the prison population, it's the, it's, it, you can't just look at one particular area. Um, and I thought, think James is also right to make a distinction between the historic backlog, which has fluctuated in any event, uh, and this temporary uh, increase, which is pandemic related, and you have to look at it from both points of view. In terms of doubling resources, uh, it can't possibly be suggested that you could, I don't know, recruit and appoint uh, twice as many Crown Court judges and twice as many magistrates over the period of time that's envisaged. Um, I don't suppose that it's possible to recruit staff um, in that time scale. But I think there are measures and steps that can be taken, um, maximizing the available resources and where necessary, um, adding to those resources in order to make the backlog um, more manageable again. But I mean, of course, you don't want people, as James has said, complainants, witnesses, defendants, um, waiting ridiculously long periods of time for mm -hmm. trial. Um, but I don't think you can rush to introduce measures um, that aren't well thought through. Great, thank you. And um, uh, Joanne, I, I think kind of staying on the point, uh, points around resources and their increase, we obviously know that um, there's been a, uh, there's been an increase to police funding um, and that we're expecting to see a 15% increase in the number of police officers. Um, over the, the next couple of years. Um, and uh, as we've talked about, uh, I think MOJ and, and HMCTS, as I understand it, are uh, to secure the funding for a doubling of resources. Will that create additional pressures for the, the young bar? Um, and uh, to what extent do you, do you think those pressures can be addressed either by the Bar Council's Young Barristers Committee or others? Um, my just dropped when you asking me the question, Carolyn. I'm sorry about that. Could you just rephrase it? Sorry. Um, so very quickly, I won't repeat the entire thing. Um, but just whether you know the the kind of increase um, in resources uh, across the police force, and you know, hopefully within the justice system, will create any pressures for the young bar. Um, and, and what could be done to relieve those pressures or, uh, you know, to address them? Well, let me make the message very clear. The Young Bar is hungry to do the work. We welcome the work when it comes. I think, to be totally frank, a lot of people are holding on in the promise of work that comes on the horizon. So anything that adds to that um, promise, getting anywhere closer would be welcomed. But there is a very valid concern that, you know, um, essentially this is all being saved up behind a dam and there's going to be a real flow of work. Um, but the bar will be ready to adapt to that. The young bar knows how to deal with returns. I think we have to remember, I know um, James referred to some of the earlier statistics, but um, at the end of 2019, there were 37,434 cases already in the backlog. A lot of young barristers are dealing with um, cases in which the defendants are on bail and they're being pushed and pushed further. And a good friend of mine contacted me today to say that they have just received a warned list for January 2023 with a backer trial of March 2023. So I think the young bar would rightly be very indignant if I said anything that wasn't entirely encouraging of getting things, getting things going and we will just do our best to deal with it. Fair enough, bring on the work. <laughs> um, we've obviously talked a lot about the, the kind of backlog in crime, but I think it's also important not to overlook the fact that there is also a backlog um, in, in civil, um, and particularly, uh, as I understand it, um, in the lower courts. Derek, uh, what, what's the Bar Council doing to, to address this uh, particular issue and um, who's it working with? Well, I suppose it's HMCTS again, isn't it, really? You're quite right to say that we mustn't overlook the fact that there is a, a backlog outside of the criminal jurisdiction. It's quite significant. I mean, there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, particularly the county court really slowed to a halt because it's really a paper-based system during the course of, of the early part of the pandemic and there just weren't the laptops and the staff who could use them and so on. And we've been encouraging that to be addressed because 
four years into the court reform program, it's a little bit disheartening that that's the position, that we've still got a 19th century court effectively operating on paper in the county court, which is actually where most people will come across the, the legal system rather than, than elsewhere. And then in the tribunals, I mean, we've got very difficult problems of a different sort, I think, in the employment tribunal where there just isn't enough capacity in terms of judges and uh, sitting days and courts to get through the present backlog. So that's going to be have to be addressed in a different way. But obviously what we are concerned about, it's the same point, I think, that, um, that James was making, is that we aren't panicked into measures which are not justified simply because we've got a, a backlog. I mean, I think with a, a lot of this, we have to recognize that there were uh, political decisions taken which have led us to the point where we are. I mean, if you take capacity out of the system, you close courts, you take funding away, you remove legal aid funding and so on, you already had a system which was, was weakened in terms of its capacity to survive a big insult like the pandemic and it will take political decisions to get out of it as well i mean there's going to have to be uh, a a real uh, incentive to to government to to try and get on top of this and it's a political one i think i mean we all we all know where we are and we all know what will be needed in order to get out of it which is essentially investment in the system so that we have a system which is a much stronger one and has more capacity yeah, certainly. And we're obviously coming on to uh, funding in, in the justice system um, shortly. Uh, I, I just wanted to kind of uh, touch upon the, the who we're working with. I mean, obviously, Derek, you've mentioned H, HMCTS, and, and I think that's fairly obvious. Um, but are there um, any specialist bar associations, for example, uh, or even uh, bar council committees that are also uh, addressing the, the civil backlog? Well, we've got a number of committees which are doing the work on that legal services committee, the uh, remuneration committee, particularly in relation to the flow of, of legal aid through the system and so on, because that's an important part of the picture as well. But I mean, it's a continuing part of the work that we're doing with all of the SBAs, really, because there are different reasons for the backlog in different bits of the system, which is the point I was making a moment ago. Great. Thank you, Derek. Um, so moving on, uh, I think that James mentioned the words extended operating hours uh, when he was answering my earlier question and, and none of us like to hear those words. Um, we obviously received confirmation last week that um, as a minimum, at least uh, HMC, HMCTS would be delaying the extended operating hours project. Um, I'm, it's obviously a, a decision that's been welcomed by the Bar Council, the Specialist Bar Associations and the circuit leaders, uh, all of whom have fought quite hard against uh, EOH. However, it, it obviously doesn't solve the fact that the backlog exists. Um, and I know that we've talked a lot about, um, you know, the difference between the backlog pre-pandemic and, and, and how it's been escalated. Um, but what I'd be interested to hear is, uh, other than anything that's already been touched upon, what alternatives should be considered to tackle the backlog um, if, if, you know, extended operating hours uh, don't go ahead as planned? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd, I'd be a bit wary about saying that you need an alternative to extended operating hours because I'm not convinced, and very few people are, I think, that you've got very much out of extended operating hours in terms of increasing capacity. And certainly once we get back to, in the Crown Court, an allocation of sitting days, then you will use up two sitting days if you have a COVID operating hours court. And I, I doubt the judiciary are very keen on that because you get effectively two rather truncated days rather than the day that we're used to. And obviously we are concerned about the discriminatory effect of it. But I think the first question is, does it really add very much in terms of additional capacity? And I, I think there's, there's not much evidence from the pilots that it does, because what the pilots really demonstrated is that if you triage cases and you select cases and you put them in front of a court that's determined to get through 
cases of a certain length and complexity that that can be done and you can increase productivity and you can also increase the number of people who turn up at court and and offer pleas i mean all of those things came out of the pilots what what they didn't really demonstrate was that you could get a lot more capacity by using covid operating hours and of course they come at a massive price in terms of you know the effect upon our working lives. I mean, basically, it just is another thing which make li makes life miserable for people who are trying to make the courts work. I mean, not just legal professionals, but other court users as well, when you've got long journey times, and you've got caring responsibilities and, and so on. So I think that's the, that's the first point. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say that we're losing very much if we have to replace COVID operating hours. And obviously, what it's about is, is capacity, isn't it? And we have pushed very hard for the government to invest and it takes money and i think the immediate response was to increase the number of nightingale courts and to remove the cap on sitting days and eventually that's where we got to at the end of 2020 and i think i'd agree with james's earlier comments we shouldn't be panicked into doing something rash which will be fundamentally discriminatory or, or indeed ineffective uh, we just need to do the simple things, which is adding extra courtrooms, making sure there are judges, making sure that we're listing and dealing with cases in a cooperative and intelligent way. And that's the way to get through the backlog. Okay, uh, James, Joanne, I don't know if you want to, to add to that at all. Can I just say, obviously, it, it, it's, uh, you know, Eric said it, it's counterproductive, EOH, I like to call it. In, in, uh, in a post-vaccination world, it will be completely unnecessary where caution but increased capacity throughout the existing estate in Nightingale courts will mean that it's redundant. You, you don't need to use one room and where the, vac the, the virus might return, it would be stupid and dangerous to do so. You, you, you simply utilize the other courtrooms that post vaccination with perhaps safety measures still in place will be available. And but this is why I, I started with the backlog sometime earlier because we need to understand that 2018 and 2019 were anomalies, record low charging rates, record low number of trials going through the criminal justice system. And what we had was a political decision to put cost saving over the lives of vulnerable people, I'm afraid to say. But that was a political decision which delayed those trials from going to the court. You had in um, 2010, 58,974 cases, Crown Court trials ready to go through the court. The time from the allegation to completion of the case, even with that number of cases, was 391 days. In 2019, with rock bottom number of cases, because of the closure of courts, the time from offence or allegation to completion had increased from 391 days to 511 days as a mean. So what you have is government creating the crisis, which has been exacerbated by the pandemic, but don't forget we can deal with things. We had judges in 2019 sitting in their rooms doing court prep days. I think Colin might agree. I mean, when I was sitting at Southwark, you had people just sitting in their rooms being allocated reading days. You know, judges at home or doing other work. You had recorders not being allowed to sit. The savings on recorders. Let me tell you that the cost paid out recorders between 2018 was 90 million and 2020 was 9 million. So they cut recorder sitting days by half. So, so what we're saying is you have that hidden group of people. You have the recorders. They've not gone away. You have the judges. They haven't gone away. You've got the increased capacity. If they can just get the extra court staff and stop using crazy cost-cutting measures, then we can move forward without crazy solutions such as EOH, COH, or, or, or interfering with juries. Yeah, and I know, Carolyn, that uh, Polly will be constrained in what she can say about this, but when both I and James have said this was a political decision, in fact, those were the words of the former senior presiding judge. Uh, we asked her about, well, why is it that there are cuts to sitting days of this magnitude? And she said, it's a political decision, which I think probably from the judiciary says it all, doesn't it? I mean, that um, that was the reason why we had the cutbacks of the drastic sort that James has just described. Yeah, well, I think on that note, I, I probably do need to, to hand over to Polly, but maybe one of the things you could uh, talk about a little in a little more detail, Polly, is uh, the the kind of practical measures 
you think could be implemented during sitting hours to to make more efficient use of, of everybody's time, which is, is something that James has picked up on um, in, in, in his own response. Well, I, I, um, I agree with what he says that, and what Derek says, which is that there are, there are the resources there um, if, if they can be used. Um, I know that, for example, the president and the family division um, has said that people need to look perhaps a little bit more closely in family cases because there's a huge pressure on family cases um, to make sure that the listing, the time estimate, um, is a realistic one. And if it, if it can be shortened, then it should be shortened. I don't think when the better case management in the Crown Court was introduced, and there's the PTPH and then the trial, it was really envisaged that there'd be such a huge gap in time between the two. So on a practical uh, measure, um, again, James was talking about completed cases, doesn't just mean where there's been a trial, um, but where there has been a resolution um, and having a pre-trial review, which sounds like it's using resource, um, is actually sometimes a very efficient way of shaking out cases that either aren't trial ready when they're listed or aren't actually going to be a trial or where there's been a four or five day time estimate given. And in fact, um, it's something that because of developments that haven't been made known to the court, because people haven't got their heads together because there hasn't been a hearing, um, could be done in a day and a half and that, that can affect the listing. Um, I also think, um, I, I know that um, in Nottingham before the pandemic um, and before some of the difficulties with the sitting days, um, there was a sort of fast track trial court where lots of short trials, perhaps a day, a day and a half were listed, again with the idea of seeing which ones were actually going to be effective. So in some respects, from a practical point of view in the criminal courts, having more short hearings between the PTPH and the trial may very often uh, produce uh, an efficiency uh, and looking at listing. And it's already been said, I mean, something good, uh, even out of a pandemic, is that the civil jurisdiction has had to face up to the fact uh, that a, a paper-based system in this day and age um, it is archaic. And so there have been huge strides in dealing with things electronically. And there's a, a pilot now here um, for a, a document upload centre, um, which may mean that we become electronically based uh, much more quickly than anybody would ever have thought about uh, pre-COVID. Hey, thank you. Yes, well, I, I know that the uh, I know that legal professionals love their paper-based practices, but um, I'm, I'm definitely excited to see uh, you know us move to the forefront of technology, um, particularly as someone that had to implement GDPR for an entire set of chambers not too too long ago. Um, we uh, less of a, a question, I think, a, a more of a statement. But from the audience, uh, one of our delegates has has said, on the basis of what has been said, it seems the challenge of the pandemic may actually highlight an opportunity to restore resources and implement a relatively easy fix slash win. So I guess that's a, a yay or nay from the panel. But do feel free to expand upon it. Well, I, I was going to say I think yes is the answer, but it depends on it depends on whether there's a there's a recognition that there is a problem which will require investment to to deal with it. I mean that's the the big problem. I mean I for for all the the optimism about the ability of the system to cope and deal with the backlog and so on, I think we also have to be realistic about what has changed since 2014, 15, 16, which is the continuing erosion of the criminal bar in particular and the hollowing out of the middle, which the, the much um, delayed CLA review, of course, is, is intended to address. And I hope it does. So we, we do need a sustainable system and we do need sustainable uh, mechanisms for making sure that fees keep up and we don't have two decades of fee cuts effectively. I mean, I think the, the, one of the lessons of austerity was that the criminal justice system was felt to be below the radar and therefore it could absorb a lot of cuts and underinvestment. And that is now coming home to roost, isn't it? I think there is a greater public awareness about it. And I suspect there is greater awareness on the part of government that you're, you either invest upfront or you pay the price at a much um, higher cost downstream and that's really a, a good way I think of looking at the criminal justice system in particular but the justice system as well as a whole. James I think you were eager to, to contribute so I won't hold hold you back. 
Yeah, I mean, what Derek has, has said, it has put the spotlight on an aging, unrepresentative profession, certainly as far as the criminal bar is concerned, 45% are 45 or over. You know, across the bar generally, you only have 38.2% women as opposed to 50.2% in the national workforce. And these stats are coming home to roost and people in government are being told them so often that even for government ministers, they do appear to be residing within their, um, their, their brains. And so that's very, very positive, as long as we build on that and we keep the pressure on them. And it also, tell you what it does, the pandemic has shown the completely dysfunctional nature of the criminal justice system. Because time and again, it shows that judiciary and HMCTS and HMCTS and PECs and the prison authorities simply do not act in a coordinated fashion. And one thing we probably need to consider which we had before, uh, and I said to others, is now a HM Inspectorate of Court Administration, uh, an overview of the systems operated within uh, the, certainly the criminal justice system, possibly the, the wider court system and the services provided by those courts, because never has it been clearer that that is needed. Now, it was in place, for those of you who can remember, it was in, implemented by the Courts Act 2003, then uh, effectively abolished by Labour and sanctioned by the Conservative government when they came in in 2011, because it was regarded as ineffectual and ineffective. But it, it, the principle, I think, is clear that we need something of that measure with an oversight on the behaviour. Because if you look at HMCTS, the lack of information we are getting, the lack of evidence from HMCTS that we are being given as to COVID courts, as to why they do certain things. They tell us the courts are safe. You know, they, they're administered by the National Audit Office, but frankly, that's not enough. You need a body with real enforcement powers, real oversight uh, across the, the justice system generally. So it, it is leading us to rethink and redevelop and hopefully restructure a, a jaded system. Great, thank you, James. So before we uh, move on, I don't know whether Joanne, there's anything you want to add to that um, or whether we should get cracking with the justice system and the lack of funding. <laughs> no, very happy to crack on because it's an important topic, but anything that promotes social mobility, I think is really, really important. And I think we all have to realize too that people who are thinking about the bar are watching this. And so it's not just us, it's the people who are thinking about this as a profession who are being consistently put off um, and who hopefully are seeing at least hope, if not a turning tide. And I think that's something to be grateful for as well. Yes, and I mean, of course, we know there is a lot of activity going on around the uh, diversity within the profession and uh, those that are entering it, but we would, we would need a, another event entirely to cover off the the wealth of activity in those areas unfortunately uh, we don't have time to to touch upon them this evening um, so moving into on to funding in the justice system our, our last topic for the evening um, and uh, i want to to explore first the the criminal legal aid review um, so the terms of reference uh, for the moj's uh, criminal legal aid review were, were recently announced and um we uh, know that the Bar Council, the Criminal Bar Association and others have already started working on their, their contributions to that. Uh, Derek, Joanne, do you uh, want to, to kind of outline what the Bar Council and, and the Young Barristers Committee are, are preparing and if there's any specific representations that um, we're, we're hoping to make or that our members can expect over the, the coming months? Well, I, perhaps I should start on that since it's a bar council question, but the the review panel itself now includes Neil Hawes and Joe Cecil, who uh, Silk and a junior, both very experienced, Neil uh, co-chair of the bar council's remuneration committee and so on. I mean, that's a recognition, I think, of both their experience as practitioners and their expertise in relation to fees. So Sir Christopher is going to be well advised in relation to the bar's perspective on criminal fees from his own panel. But it doesn't end there because the Bar Council has its own working group on CLA, which again includes representatives from the CBA. We're working together with the CBA 
on this issue. We have a data sharing agreement with HMCTS, which is, is very helpful. Thank you, HMCTS, for that. So it does give us a, a good platform for being able to feed in our own views based upon real data about what's going on. And I have to say, the, the data, I think, is unequivocal. I don't think Sir Christopher will have any difficulty with that. And we have been suggesting that it, it might be appropriate to move fairly quickly to findings about what the nature of the problem is, and then to move on to solutions. And obviously solutions are is a more difficult area. But I think that's the, the nature of the exercise which suggests itself to us, that you can fairly and rapidly, fairly easily and rapidly identify what the problem is and what the relevant data is. And then you have to move on to the question of, of solutions. Uh, James and I went to see Sir Christopher, in fact, and we outlined that whatever that solution is, it's got to involve a sustainable fee structure because it, it isn't, that isn't the position at the moment. It's got to involve um, appropriate pay for the work that's done. And it's got to be subject to some form of review mechanism that means that it can't be allowed to slip behind, which is what the government has consistently done. So that in effect, you get a pay cut because nothing is done to keep pace with inflation and so on. So I think my I went away from that meeting think, thinking that he had understood the problem. He should do because he's got a, a background, not in crime, but in a wider area and has sat as well as a recorder. So we keep our fingers crossed. We've also impressed upon him the urgency of completing the review and then of government in implementing the reforms, which whatever they are that he suggests. Well, it sounds very uh, positive. Thank you, Derek. Um, Joanne, are, are the, uh, the Young Barristers Committee feeding, feeding into this in, in any way? Um, it's obviously very important for the, for the Young Bar as, as well as uh, the more senior bar, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one thing that's really, really important and that the profession as a whole realises is that there are discrepancies um, that are completely inconsistent with all of the work that's been done to improve diversity. Um, so the discrepancies between um, gender payment and, and, and racial disparity in terms of payment are all being fed in. So that's one thing that I think we're all really, really keen on. I can't add anything to what Derek has said in terms of how this is proceeding because it's entirely accurate. But from the point of view of the future of the bar and equality of payment going forward, all that I can say is there have been genuine and continued efforts being made to ensure that those are addressed. And those are key aims of what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to make things more fair. Um, and so it's not really an answer to the question, but um, we are feeding in, but it's not just youth. It's, it's every section of the bar. We know that there's a disparity and it needs to get better. Great, thank you. And obviously this is the, the criminal legal aid review that we're discussing. So it'd be remiss of me not to ask for the opinion of the chair of the Criminal Bar Association. Um, James, what are the CBA hoping to, to kind of achieve through CLA? <laughs> Where do we start? Bringing, <laughs> uh, say bringing, <laughs> bringing fairness and a proper structure, a depoliticized structure to criminal legal aid funding. First of all, you know, they've got to bring up to date pay schemes which have fallen far below their true rates. I mean, the first iteration of AGFS was 1997. Some of the fees in some cases have fallen by more than 70% since then. But even if you ignore uh, Carter in 2005 and you only look at start at 2010, when we had the first of three years of four and a half percent cuts, 13 and a half percent, and then you take on top inflation. In real terms, all the fees have been cut in excess of 40 percent. And so never in the public sector has such cuts been made to such a, a, a grouping. So that's appalling. And so you need, you know, obviously then uh, key issues that Derek and I have discussed and others, you need to look at an independent payment review body such as exists for dentists. We need to take government out of this because this is just you know, an annual problem. This, this series of arguments, this series of delays, this series of um, you know, changes in administration, that, that's got to go. We need clear structured uh, reviews which take into account inflation and other factors uh, and all happening well away 
from the highly publicized eye. Because unless you have consistency, unless you have um, a thought out approach, then you just, and, and unless you have fair rates of remuneration, you're just going to lose people, as Joanne said, hands over fist. You're just going to lose. And, and, and the people who end up suffering are the complainants and the defendants, the victims, the, the witnesses, the participants in the criminal process, because you end up having a two tier, three tier system with a bar, a money background, not representative of society in any way, shape or form. And you have an elitist justice system. And we've got to avoid that at all costs. No, certainly. I, I definitely agree with that. I think everyone on, on this call, on this call, on as part of this event would even. Um, Polly, I, I want to involve you in this. I, I think um, the question I have for you is, is does the judiciary recognise the, the pressures facing the criminal bar? Um, and do you think we've reached a stage where something has to be done to, uh, to address the situation? Um, yes, we recognise the pressures facing the criminal bar. I certainly talking to any of my colleagues, we're acutely aware of it um, and have real concerns, not just uh, as James has said, but if you think about the judiciary that you want to represent and reflect society, if people leave the professions because of that inequality, failure of retention, um, then you're not going to ultimately get the judiciary that, that appropriately reflects society. You're going to end up with the people who could afford to stick it out. No, completely. Um, and again, I think diversity within the judiciary is something that the, the Bar Council is looking at quite quite carefully with uh, relevant stakeholders. So it feeds into some of what we were saying earlier about having an entirely separate event for uh, diversity drives and, and otherwise. Um, so uh, moving on, we I, for those of you that, that aren't aware, we recently conducted a, a survey and in that survey, it indicated that 80% of the, the publicly funded bar have incurred personal debt or use savings to support their practice during the pandemic. Um, and the 84% of, of the publicly funded bar are also still billing lower fee income compared to the, their pre-COVID-19 usual. Um, and unfortunately, 43% of that 84% are seeing a reduction of, of over 50%, a lot of percentages being thrown around. Um, we can post the, the full report. Um, within the chat function. Um, it was very clear from that, that members of the young bar were struggling the most um, and over a quarter of them were experiencing, experiencing very uh, quite significant financial hardship. Um, Joanne, I'm, I'm sure that the Young Barristers Committee uh, is therefore quite <laughs> vested um, or rather has quite a vested interest in the outcomes of, of CLA and of other consultations. Um, and you've obviously talked a little bit about the, the input that you've, you've had or you will have with CLA. Are there any other activities uh, that the committee is planning in, uh, in relation to, to the funding of, um, of the bar? I think that the committee is very reactive. Um, I mean, last year, as soon as the pandemic hit, Catherine Duncan, who chaired um, set up a series of meetings and she and I both attended with various young barristers from across different specialist bar associations um, and essentially they were all dealing with different issues and we shouldn't in any way disregard the fact that impact to income is proportionately going to affect everyone um, who's going through it and just because some areas of law are hardest hit um, we know that we are um, the representative body for all young barristers so what I would say is we're here and we're listening and we're willing to engage. We did um, organise a seminar in the latter part of last year to deal with um, dealing with financial, the financial impact of coronavirus. And obviously we'll continue to be reactive as needs be. Um, but we're here and we're engaging. And um, Derek, on his part, has made sure that, you know, we always have a seat at the table and we always have his ear and the ear of the Bar Council generally. So it is it is essentially a very, um, we are actually all collaborating all the time on a daily and weekly basis. So um, as problems come up, we deal with them. So all we can say is we encourage people to talk to us and um, the Specialist Bar Associations are already doing that through Derek as well. Great, thank you. Um... I mean, Derek, given the, 
given what we've seen through the various surveys of, of the profession over the last 12 months, um, I think we have to, to kind of ask the question, how close to breaking point are we? Um, and I, I, I'm very conscious that that question maybe doesn't apply to certain practitioners, but for those that are at the publicly funded bar in particular, um, I think it's very relevant. Um, I don't know if you want to kind of expand upon the, the areas of concern um, and, and how they might impact, for example, uh, diversity of the profession, which we've touched upon a lot this evening. Yes, I mean, I think the it's undoubtedly the case that the effects of the pandemic have not been felt equally across all parts of the bar. I mean, there are some bits of the bar that have been able to work remotely very effectively and been able to work in the courts remotely effectively or, or in person where that's been required. So I think bits of the bar have, have managed to carry on working very effectively. Some people haven't seen much of a reduction in, in income. So it's an uneven effect, undoubtedly, although it would be wrong to assume, for example, that civil practitioners are simply unaffected by this. Again, it just depends on what sort of work you do and where you, where you do it. But uh, undoubtedly, the publicly funded bar, particularly the criminal bar, particularly those areas where the courts had a slowdown in work and throughput or where um, funding and payment is particularly dependent upon there being a hearing at some point, all of those things have impacted on, the, on those bits of the bar disproportionately. And of course, to tie that in with the second part of your question, those are also areas of the bar in many cases where the greatest strides have been made in terms of diversity and accessibility. So we obviously are concerned that we will go backwards. And I think to use the phrase that James um, used that we will have a sort of two tier bar with people who are, are able to fund themselves. And you know we don't want to get back to the bar as a sort of hobby for people who come from wealthy backgrounds or anything like that, because it would undo a lot of the progress that we've made. Are we at breaking point? Well, I don't know. Again, I think that depends on the nature of the recovery, really. I think, as Joanne was saying earlier, when the dam bursts, there might be a, an absolute deluge of work in, in certain areas. So we may see a lot of work coming back. Uh, in terms of keeping track on that, I noticed someone was asking about the backlog in legal aid fees. And I've, I've had a number of meetings with the acting head of, or chief exec of the legal aid agency. And there is actually an upturn, you know, we're back to 60% of the throughput that we had before the pandemic and it's rising all the time. So that's a sort of indicator that there are some green shoots. We've had some very, uh, I think, helpful moves by the CPS to accelerate payments and to allow the bar to be paid for things at an earlier stage than was previously the case. So I think there is a recognition all round that we need to make sure that we keep um, fees payment moving through the system in anticipation of a point at which work picks up again. And of course, one way of looking at the backlogs is that they are, if not a bonanza, at least a store of value, but which we're all going to have access to in future once we, we get the system back on its feet. Great, thank you. And uh, I, I'm going to warn the, the audience that we're moving on to our, our last uh, joint question. So if they have any of their own, then I, I encourage them to ask them now. Um, the, the last thing that I wanted to touch upon is, is uh, the, the general public. Um, and we know that practitioners like the, the secret barrister have consistently uh, stated that in order for us to make any headway with the underfunding of the justice system, we need to change the public's perception of its relevance to them and of the, the levels of remuneration that are actually received by publicly funded barristers. Um, I'm, I'm happy to open this out to everyone, but Derek, do you, do you want to start by uh, just covering off the, the projects the Bar Council has planned that maybe have a more public audience in mind? Well, we've got Justice Week coming up and obviously we have initiatives around public legal education and so on. So I think there is a lot of ongoing work which is to do with trying to dispel some of those myths that you're talking about about the bar. I mean, not just about the publicly funded bar, but also about what barristers actually do. I mean, I think the secret barrister is right to say that there is a sort of general lack of understanding and uh, the sort of 
the perpetuation of a number of urban myths about what work at the bar means. So I think we, we do have a job to do there. I mean, we're never going to be in the same position in terms of public regard as teachers and hospital workers and so on. But I do think that's changing. I mean, not least because of work such as that done by the by the secret barrister in bringing legal issues to the attention of the public. I mean, that's that's a different take, I think, on on the role of, of barristers. I mean, it's um, it's a paradox, isn't it, that we're, we're always the most sort of interesting legal subject for legal programmes, apart from the police on, on TV, but they in themselves perpetuate this myth of a rather old fashioned profession that um, you know, has a, a mix of, of well-funded people and those who are sort of driven by their passion for particular areas of the law. But you know, the mix is somewhere between the two, isn't it? It's a vital public service, which avoids a lot of problems which otherwise have to be met by other parts of our society if it works well. And if it doesn't work well, then we all suffer the effects and the costs which are knock-on costs from it failing. Uh, great, thank you, Derek. Joanne, do you want to, to add to that at all? Um, not particularly, aside from the fact that I do think that the modern bar is, because of the fact that communication is better, we're able to speak to people who aren't necessarily our own family and friends through things like social media. Um, that is obviously a two-way issue. It's, sometimes it's beneficial and sometimes it's very much detrimental. But I do think that... Um, there is at least scope now with the way the modern bar presents itself and making events more publicly available. I think that at least for anyone who's interested, it's there. Um, a lot of people that you speak to at court, um, it does change their perception of the bar and barristers generally. So hopefully as the modern bar embraces technology, and I hope as we do become more representative of society, people will recognise um, barristers as people who are like them and maybe are more willing to listen to um, their day-to-day -day concerns and interests. It's, it's good and bad. Um, and I hope that they can see the bar as the well-rounded profession that it is. And I hope that that will improve as time goes on. Yeah, I mean, pre-pandemic, I, I liked to think that I was doing my bit by correcting the impression that every single taxi driver had of the uh, of the legal profession. So I think if that's the minimum you could do, you could reach a lot of people that way, potentially. Um, and on that note, <laughs> we are actually coming to the end of the event. We've, uh, we've clearly stunned our audience into silence, or at least I hope that's the case. Um, and, and before we go, I just want to say obviously thank you to, to our panel uh, for joining us this evening. Um, and also to, to ask our audience or rather to encourage our audience to complete the, full, the feedback form they will be receiving um, hopefully later tonight, um, just because it really helps us to understand, you know, what you might want to hear from the Bar Council going forward and, and how we can improve the, the events that we're offering more generally. Um, finally, I mentioned earlier this evening that we would be holding another Q&A which relates to well-being uh, later this month. That's going to be taking place on the 24th of February um, and it will be up on the website hopefully before the end of the week. Um, so do come and join us for that. It will also be free um, and hopefully, uh, hopefully have a lot of interest to our members. Um, so thank you once again, everybody, and uh, I hope everyone, everyone in our audience and on the panel has a, a lovely evening.